This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. All right, let's see it. He is the sun anthropomorphized, and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about the solar messiah. So the title Messiah comes from a Hebrew word that means anointed one, and our conceptualization of it today is based on the convergence of apocalyptic literature with the concept of an anointed one within early Judaism. And there is not remotely a linguistic or a conceptual equivalent anywhere in ancient Egyptian literature or ideology. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the Virgin Isis, Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and upon his birth he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12 he was a prodigal child teacher, and at the age of 30 he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. So only one of these claims is even partially true, and that's the notion that Horus healed the sick because Horus was a deity of healing. Now, there are not narratives about Horus going around healing sick people along the side of the road, but Horus was a deity that would be appealed to in order to heal the sick. Not a single one of the rest of those claims is true in any way, shape, or form whatsoever, and there is no primary text from ancient Egypt that supports any of it. It's all literally just made up. Now, somebody's going to say, well, prove it. Not my job to prove it. It's the job of the individual making the claim to provide the evidence or the data to support their claim. There are no data that support these claims because, again, they're literally just made up. So people are going to point to the movie uh, Zeitgeist, or they're going to point to a 19th century book, or they're going to point to a website where someone is asserting these claims. But what no one can point to is a primary text from ancient Egypt that demonstrates any single one of those claims. Because, again, they're literally just made up. Attis of Phrygia, born of the Virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected. Not a single one of these claims is supported by any ancient source. Uh, the closest we get is the fact that Attis uh, died either because of or shortly following self-castration, either under a tree or after death was turned into a tree. Uh, there is also an association of Attis with the myth of the dying and rising God, which is a 19th century conceptual framework that isn't really used by scholars anymore. But there's no resurrection involved. Uh, what happens is that Zeus makes it so that Attis's corpse never decomposes, and there are stories about Attis's blood making flowers grow wherever it flows. So uh, nothing remotely related to the claims in this video. Krishna of India, born of the Virgin Devaki, with a star in the east signaling his coming. He performed miracles with his disciples, and upon his death was resurrected. So like all deities and divine humans in the ancient world, Krishna was said to have performed miracles. Uh, I don't think we can refer to their post-mortem exaltation as remotely comparable to resurrection as we understand it today. Uh, the star in the east is made up. Uh, and I think we are really straining at the data to say that Krishna was born of a virgin. Most accounts have Krishna being born naturally from the union of their mother Devaki and their father Vasudeva. Now there is an account that kind of muddies the waters regarding the involvement of Vasudeva in that conception. But uh, if we read it parthenogenetically, at most, the conception is parthenogenetic. It does not mean that Devaki was a virgin. But we don't need to posit some kind of pre-existing template to explain where the idea of the virgin birth came from. We know where it came from. It came from the uh, Greek translation of Isaiah's reference to a young woman having conceived that will give birth. It's translated in the Septuagint as Parthenos or virgin, and that's picked up in a secondary tradition regarding Jesus's birth uh, as being virginal or parthenogenetic. So we already know where it comes from. We don't need to posit some pre-existing template. Dionysus of Greece, born of a virgin on December 25th, was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine. 
He was referred to as the King of Kings, God's only begotten Son, the Alpha and Omega, and many others. And upon his death, he was resurrected. So again, this is all totally made up. None of this is supported by any ancient primary sources apart from the generic and universal claim to have performed miracles. Uh, I've looked at this claim that Dionysus turned water into wine, and the closest I can find in any text or tradition that predates uh, the Gospel of John is a story about Dionysus replacing the water of a stream with wine so that a nymph that comes there to drink will become drunk and will be easier to seduce. Uh, the other descriptions of empty pitchers being filled with wine overnight and wine flowing magically from grapes without the fermentation process and water coming out where wine was supposed to be and all those kinds of things uh, date to the second century CE and later. So I don't think there's a good case to make that these uh, directly influence the composition of the Gospel of John, but there certainly could be something there. I have never seen a good argument for uh, any kind of direct influence. Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th. He had 12 disciples and performed miracles, and upon his death was buried for three days and thus resurrected. He was also referred to as the truth, the light, and many others. Interestingly, the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. So again, all of this is literally just made up. There are no primary texts from the ancient world that demonstrate any of these claims. The closest we get is a text from the middle of the fourth century that states that an emperor dedicated a temple to Sol Invictus on December 25th in the 270s CE, so centuries after the Gospels had been composed. And if you would like a great scholarly discussion of misinformation about Mithras and Mithraism and its relationship to Christianity and the Roman Empire, I would recommend checking out this book from 2008.